I, uh, my name is Bill Linnell. I was the spokesperson for Cheap for Safer Power, uh, which uh, grew out of the Maine Nuclear Referendum Committee. I was the spokesperson for the Maine Nuclear Referendum Committee, and we changed the name a couple times, Maine Safe Energy, because um, we wanted to get our message across. And uh, ultimately, we ended up with Cheap for Safer Power. And um, I started, well, when they wanted to put a high level nuclear weapons in Maine, I uh, went to a couple of the meetings, the hearings. They were talking about putting the dump in Tobago Lake, and I knew that was a water supply for Greater Portland. So I thought it didn't sound like a good idea, and I studied it. And the more I get into it, the, the more problems I found with nuclear power. And then um, I, you know, went to to hearings, meetings, and on the Texas waste dump issue, I became uh, the spokesman. And I decided that we needed to take Maine Yankee down, and I dedicated years of my life to taking Maine Yankee down, and we succeeded. We we shut Maine Yankee down 12 years before their uh, license exp was was going to expire. And um, incidentally, I was I happened to be in Russia the day Chernobyl blew up. That was just the icing on the cake uh, for me. But I was already, you know, committed on this issue. And uh, I've testified before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I was on, uh, you know, had a lot of uh, time in the media. Um, uh, I um, let's see what else. Um, I can a little later. I'll get I'll get into just how we how we did it at the end. But I I gained a lot of credibility uh, because at the time I was a Republican. Uh, I switched to the Green Party uh, after because the, the Republicans just didn't want to. Uh, I, I just couldn't get them to to listen to me about Maine Yankee at all. So I I I was fed up, and the Green Party welcomed me. Uh, and my uh, values are more consistent with theirs. Um, let's see what, oh, I was gonna tell you. Uh, so I became a, uh, I was elected to the town council in Cape Elizabeth uh, when I was a Republican. And that gave me a huge standing and, a, and sort of a pulpit uh, in a sense to uh, talk about Maine Yankee. And I did it very deliberately because I knew that Cape Elizabeth being one of the richest towns in the state of Maine, uh, that uh, I would have more credibility than if I were, you know, sort of a, an act, a, a peace activist. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that I, I thought I'd get more attention. And um, if, if I were uh, an elected official. And so I, I, uh, I did that and, um, then on the steam generator issue, because I, I was, I really studied this stuff. I mean, I ate a lot of peanut butter sandwiches for years because I wasn't really paying attention to my own. You know, I didn't have a 401k. I didn't have a, uh, you know, a, a career oriented job. I was commercial fishing, lobstering, working as a carpenter um, so that my primary focus could be fighting Maine Yankee, going to hearings up in Augusta, lobbying uh, to shut down Maine Yankee. And um, so I worked on that. And then when the steam generator tubes were cracking, you know, I remember when the first, there was an announcement, the plant, the plant shut down for a few days and they discovered uh, steam gener generator tubes were cracked. And of course they said, well, it's, it's not a problem. We found, I forget how many, say 50 cracked tubes or 24 cracked tubes or something. And they said, but, you know, we'll have them all, we'll have this problem taken care of and, and uh, you know, we'll be back uh, up and running in no time. And, uh, and uh, I chimed in, I put out a press release and I said, that's not true. I said, they, these are cracked and they're going to find more cracked tubes. Uh, in, when they inspected again in a week and sure enough, a week later, they found like a hundred more cracked tubes and they put out a similar press release saying that they would, uh, well, everything was fine. You know, there was no danger to the public and, and, um, you know, but that's it. We're not going to 
you know, this is the extent of the problem. And I put out another press release and I said, that's a lie. It's incorrect. It's false. Um, they're going to, when they inspect the plan again in another, in another week or so, they'll find another hundred crack tubes. And this went on for several, several weeks. And because uh, I had remembered, you know, from, from, uh, you know, I was a teenager during Vietnam and, you know, every night there was a report on how many Vietnamese were killed, how many Americans were killed. And it was kind of numbing and it was on every night. You, you, the, the new totals and, and it kind of reminded me of that they would keep saying well there's so many steam tubes that are cracked and so forth and so uh all of a sudden and then they and i was disagreeing with them very publicly and they said well mr linnell you know he's just a nuclear activist you know we're we're the nrc we're the we're the new we're the main yankee we have nuclear experts on fire uh, you know in house and so forth and he's just an activist and my response was, well, you know, if, if um, having a, you know, being a, a nuclear power official, uh, you know, is the criteria, well, then maybe, you know, we should stop listening to them altogether because uh, uh, they're wrong. You know, they've been wrong week after week here. And so that's when um, the media started coming to me and uh, I, I got a, had a, you know, a, a big jump in, uh, in credibility. And the, the issue was I had done my homework and, and I found that the partic that particular alloy that the steam tubes were made out of uh, in Canal 600 was used in plants around the world. And every place they used it, the pipes were cracking and every place um, they actually ordered new stem steam generators. Even if they were repairing them, they still ordered new steam generators. They weren't taking any chances. Main Yankee was trying to fix them without getting new ones, but I, I thought they would need would need new ones. So, and I'll take a pause if anyone has a quick question, or I can keep going. It's involved with cracked tubes like that, and with, does that leak radioactive uh, material? Sure. Good question. Well, you know, it's interesting. The steam tubes. The the uh, the the uh, the water inside the steam tubes or the steam is radioactive, and the real the danger is the dangers there in a couple different ways. Uh, very dangerous situation potentially because the water uh, the steam that's in the tube is radioactive, and it act, the steam generators are not in the containment; they're outside the containment building. And so if there is a rupture, you have, you know, it's a, it's a pathway for the radiation that's in the building to get outside the building, outside the container. And the other issue is, you know, there is a, there's an NIT uh, study that showed that, uh, or that estimated that if I think seven tubes cracked at once, uh, you'd have an uncontrollable accident because they, they, if they if those two tubes cracked and broke, uh, they could they'd whip them around and break uh, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of other tubes, and you'd have, uh, you know, you'd have kind of a meltdown situation. So it's, it it was a big deal. When you say the, the steam tubes, is that the same thing as the spent fuel rods? No. 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 But see, the, the key is the, the, the fuel rods, they all leak. They leak. Or not every single one, from, but fuel rods leak. And that's why we have, uh, you know, that's why we have a lot of uh, contamination from nuclear plants. If the fuel rods didn't leak, uh, then... The, you know, the, the radiation uh, would be uh, contained within the fuel rods and you wouldn't have all these low level leaks and support in the, in the venting into the atmosphere. And so it's important to recognize that no matter what they say, the, the reality is they leak. They all leak. I mean, every plant has leaks. They leak on a daily basis, but the government allows it. So these steam tubes that you're talking about, what's in those tubes? water yes oh okay and is it the water the water from the river and is that brackish or fresh water 
uh, it should be uh, it should be fresh water. Uh, see the water. There's water around the steam, uh, around the fuel rods. Okay, <laughs> the fuel rods heat the water up. The that water goes into the steam tube. Uh, well, actually, it goes into a pipe, goes outside the containment building into the steam generator building, and then those tubes. It's basically like a car radio. Those there's thousands. I forget how many. I can't remember. It's like four thousand or seven thousand tubes in in each generator. And there's typically like three generators, and there's water theoretically clean water flowing all around the outside of the tubes and the heat uh, the the heat uh, the heated radioactive water on the inside of the tubes the heat is transferred through the metal wall of the tube and heats the water on the outside of the tube which is still in like this giant bottle essentially uh, I mean a metal. and that and that steam spins the, the turbines that create uh, you know the electrical energy. Well, can can you then explain how it finally came about that the plant closed? Sure. Well, what I emphasize, you know, it was clear to me that people have different opinions about science and this and that, but. You know, one of the things we all have in common is, is the concern for our wallets. And so I always thought that there are a lot of conservatives and others who were willing to take their chances with, you know, no one really thinks they're ever going to be in a plane crash or, you know, a, a fatal car accident or, or the nuclear plant down the road is going to melt down. I mean, we all... You know, we, we couldn't go through life if we were worried about, you know, it, it, it's just unthinkable that, that we'd have a disaster in our lives, like, like a Fukushima or Chernobyl, that magnitude. But, um, you know, it, it can happen. And if it does, it can be disastrous. In fact, you know, one thing I do point out is um, there'll always be another plane crash, unfortunately. I mean, I still, I, I still fly, but there will, there will be another plane crash, another, you know, airliner later, some day, some year, and just like that, there will always be another nuclear plane accident. The problem is, what with a new, with a, with an airliner, although tremendously tragic, you know, you could lose three or four hundred lives in an airliner, and, and impact family, you know, you know hundreds and thousands of people would be impacted and it's a terrible tragedy. With a nuclear plant, uh, typically there isn't, there aren't that many, there aren't that many deaths right away or that you can, can easily see, although they still happen uh, because of the, the insidious nature of radiation. But you could have an area the size of Pennsylvania that's uninhabitable for, for eternity. So, you know, after Chernobyl occurred, Italy, for example, said, okay, we're done with nuclear plant. But they realized that if a nuclear plant meltdown in Italy, I mean, Italy would be would, would be gone. They'd all have to, the Italians would have to, you know, go to Switzerland, France, the United States, wherever. You know, they wouldn't be fit to live in. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, 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 that's the danger. Well, anyway, I, I focused on the economic issue. Uh, I still study the health issues, and, and those are very real and very, very uh, serious. But I tried to put more emphasis on the economics. And I uh, worked with Tom Coffin and Mariah Holt. Tom Coffin actually had the notion, because he was the previous spokesman for the Maine Nuclear Referendum Committee, and he said, you know, we've lost three referenda to close down Maine Yankee, and he felt that People were reluctant to vote to shut it down because the, the company was so it was very effective in scaring people. Yeah. You know, we're all going to be eating in soup kitchens if we close Maine Yankee because we need we, we need that cheap power and you know, it's going to sue the state of Maine because they you know they should they had a original license that was going to last 40 years until 2008. 
and so on. And so Tom actually had the idea and he said, he thought it might be, uh, it might be important to or effective to have a referendum that said simply, when Maine Yankees license comes out, that's it. No extension, no, you know, no extensions allowed. And I think he was right. And because I think a lot of people, while they were reluctant to shut Maine Yankee down early, uh, they, they wouldn't necessarily want to tempt fate and, and give it an extension to run longer. They, you know, I think Mainers are pretty shrewd sometimes, and you know, we weren't willing to, a lot of Mainers weren't willing to push their luck. And I had done some research and I found out, you know, the steam regenerators uh, were uh, toast. And I figured that the only way Main Yankee could afford to buy new steam generators was if they could get a license extension. And in other words, they needed more than, they needed to go longer than 2008 to pay back the loan if they borrowed money, simply to install, buy and install three new steam generators. Well, I thought the idea was a winner and uh, Tom agreed with me. And um, now there was some resistance because people thought that, you know, I had sold out, that I wasn't willing to shut the plant down early. Uh, you know, and and the people, that, well, some people in West Cassett were up in arms, and they didn't want to they didn't want to talk about it because unless you shut the plant down early, they didn't just they didn't want to talk to you. But what, as I explained to the Green Party at a meeting up in Belfast, I said, um, you need to understand, my objective is to shut them down early, and if we if they know that they cannot run beyond 2008, they'll have to shut down now, or back then at the time, they'd have to shut down in the uh, 94, 95, 96, because there's no way they, if they couldn't get the extension, there's no way they could finance the food generator so, so they wouldn't be able to open back up. And that was the strategy. And and I, I thought it was a winner. Now, Main Yankee was on the rope. It had support from Angus King. He was he's kind of a he's a nice guy, but he's a corporatist. And um, uh, he uh, anyway, so they were uh, you know they were they they wanted to stay open. Um, I also found out later that the reactor itself needed to be replaced, but I didn't know this until years after the, after we shut the plant down but i found i found that information out later um but anyway so i went to a lawyer uh, Jonathan Hull, in the damn scott, damn scott mm -hmm. uh, and he drafted a referendum that would shut the plant down in 2008 and we had it all Oh, I'm sorry. I, I interrupted myself. What I meant, wanted to say was, Maine Yankee was on the ropes. While they did have the support of Angus King, they needed a big company like Entergy uh, to buy them out. Uh, you know, a company with a lot of deep pockets that could afford the repairs they needed. And so uh, they were, you know, their 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 life or death of the nuclear plant depended on being bought by a big company with a lot of money. Central Maine Power, Maine Yankee, on, the, on their own, they weren't going to survive. They were not going to be able to put in the steam generators and make them back up. So, uh, anyway, I, I had a referendum uh, drafted in legalese by uh, Attorney Hull in the Democrata area. He's a great attorney, very capable. Um, and I, I took it to the Secretary of State and got it all registered and so forth. Uh, I didn't end, we didn't end up having to collect signatures, but I had it all ready to go. If, if need be, we've done all the legwork and the next step would have been to, you know, print, uh, uh, print sign up sheets and get people to uh, uh, sign on for the referendum. Uh, and 
so energy was uh, poised. You know, Main Yankee was courting energy, and it was coming down to a, a board meeting at Main Yankee's uh, corporate offices in Brunswick. I know that their corporate offices were upwind of the plant. You know, they knew better than to be. You know, they weren't interested in being right at the plant. They were. They were you know, ten miles upwind. Uh, but anyway, they. Uh, uh, you know, it was all coming down to this this this, this final board meeting of the of the board of directors of Entity, whether to uh, buy the plant. So I put together a package. I had a cover letter, and I had a copy of the proposed referendum, and I included a lot of my newspaper clippings. Uh, you know, the, uh, mine and others. Uh, Showing so that the folks at Entergy would know that they'd have a tiger by the tail if they tried to mess with the people in the state of Maine, the anti-nuclear activists. You know, we were we were pit bulls. And again, I you know, I, and I basically said, you know, here's the history. Uh, I'm the spokesman for uh, Chief of State of Power, former Maine Nuclear Referendum Committee. Um, we're, we're going to fight to the death here, and uh, and here's a copy of the referendum. You're not you're not going to be able to run the plant past 2008. And I and basically uh, included a bunch of those, my clippings, and I said, basically, if you guys want to rumble, let's rumble. You know, and because I know that, and as an and uh, what I didn't say in a letter, but my understanding is that. The folks that make those kinds of big business decisions, they're very, they're hard nosed businessmen, but they don't like risk. And I wanted them to know that, you know, there was a, there was a very, very realistic possibility that if they bought main unity, they'd be buying, uh, uh, you know, a dead horse because they wouldn't be able to extend the license. So I, you know, I, I'd give anything to have a, uh, a film, you know, the fly in the wall in the board meeting. But I, I, I think we, uh, I think we made a difference, and and I think that's a, a big reason why Maine Yankee shut down. The other thing is, I argued for years that Maine Yankee power was actually more expensive than other options, common options on the market, and they denied it every single time. Uh, I even had a. Uh, some some information on official letterhead showing the all the, the sources of power uh, that were cheaper than Maine Yankee, and they basically denied it. But the day they shut down, they had a three or four page uh, print release, as I recall. And in that, they they acknowledged that the reason they shut down is that there was plenty of power on the New England grid, which was far cheaper there at that time main yankee was wholesaling power for about 5 cents a kilowatt hour and there was power all over New England for one cent a kilowatt hour so economics did kill them and they had you know they had uncontrollable costs well you know uh, now, first, I, well, that's an excellent, you know, that's an excellent question and a concern. Uh, let me preface this. I want to tell you that, although I live in Portland, Wiscasset is very near and dear to my heart. My grandmother came from Wiscasset. In fact, on the main drag there up the hill from Red's Eats, they used to, for a while in recent years there was a little antique store called the Wizard of Odds. And that's where my grandmother's family lived. They lived upstairs and downstairs with a pharmacy and a you know, little ice cream counter and so forth, as they did in those days, you know, back in the early 1990s. Um, it's very near and dear to my heart. Now, all the high-level waste, the spent fuel that Maine Yankee ever created, remains in West Cassett. Um, they put them in the dry cast storage uh, in, in, uh, in uh, I forget how many casts, but there's there's quite a few casts. And they did that. They separated them out of, out of a spent fuel pool 
And the reason is it's comparatively safer in the dry casks because they don't need, in the dry casks, they don't need to keep, have cooling water circulating around them as they did when, they, when the plant was running. And so since you don't need circulating water, you know, that's a, you don't have to worry about losing you know, electricity or something or your, your, your pumps, water pumps failing and having a problem. Uh, however, you know, the is still there. Um, you know, it's not where I'd pitch my tent, you know, if I wanted to go camping. Um, but and, and I know a lot of people are concerned about, and they may, they, they'd like to get that waste out of there. And, and again, the reason I talked about um, West Cassidy is very near and dear to my heart. My concern is that if we did get that waste out of there, people, there's too many people that they will, as long as there's money in it, they will allow a nuclear plant to run, as long as there's money in it for them. Ultimately, nuclear is the most expensive form of power uh, on the face of the earth today. But a lot of people, they're, they're willing to let a nuclear plant run, they just don't want the nuclear waste. And so my feeling is that, you know, the, the people of Maine voted three times to keep Maine Yankee open. Wiscasset, the town of Wiscasset supported Maine Yankee. Of course, certainly a lot of people in Wiscasset did not. My feeling is that the, the radioactive waste and those dry casts should stay right where it is because otherwise we run the risk of having another nuclear plant built. If, if people think they can shift the waste out to Nevada or someplace like that, they might be tempted to let another plant go up, you know, be built there. And so for that reason, and I know it's a, it's tough uh, on people that live right around there, uh, but for that reason, I, I support keeping the waste right where it is and not and putting it in a sort of a national dump. Can I mention a scary thing? <laughs> when, okay, when the plant was still operating, uh, near, nearby is this very small airport, the Wiscasset Airport, uh, private planes. And for $70, you can have someone take you up for a half hour. So I chipped in with a friend one time, I had my cameras and they'll go wherever you want. And one of the things I said, Oh, would you fly over Maine Yankee? So I'm leaning out the window with my camera, sh shooting all these pictures of the dome and everything. And I was thinking, my God, you know, if a terrorist, if I was a terrorist, because I almost dropped my camera down on Maine, can, you know, you could drop something. And the same thing with the spent fuels. There's, there's like this no security. And these days we have a lot more leaning to people around, I think, than we did 20 years ago, whenever this was. And and this, the safety of it really bothers me. Plus that's a beautiful piece of waterfront. You know, I mean, they put this nuclear power plant up on a, a wonderful piece of property, you know, and, um, but, Wiscasset likes it because the federal government is is paying Wiscasset to keep it there, right? To keep the fuel. I believe so. Yes. <laughs> so they, well, they, I mean, they they might as well get some income for it since the since they're stuck with it, stuck with the waste. Um, to go back to your first observation about flying over it, um, the containment building uh, is strong. <laughs> which stood, uh, you know, people dropping stuff out of a plane, it pro I think the campaign building likely would have withstood, say, a Cessna 150 or a Cessna 172 crashing into it. However, um, probably the, the greatest, best energy expert in the world, Amory, Lo Amory Lovins, uh, wrote, uh, he wrote a number of books and and one of them, he, he actually said that one of the problems with a nuclear plant is that a terrorist, uh, you know, commandeered an airliner that 
you know, they could crash into, you know, a, a you know, a kamikaze or, or, you know, a suicide run at a, at a nuclear plant. They could, uh, you know, they could destroy a nuclear plant. And of course, then, you know, years later, and this is that book, it was written long before 9-11 when we saw what an airliner could do to a skyscraper. So I think um, you know, the nuclear industry tried to portray nuclear plants as inherent, as uh, safe, you know, they talk about redundant safety systems. They, if you went on a tour there, they'd have this guy walk out there with an automatic weapon, you know, a machine gun. And everyone would think, ooh, you know, boy, wow, automatic weapon. No, no, I mean, most of us never see it, have never seen a machine gun in person. And, you know, they might mean Yankee would march this guy out there and show everybody the machine gun, and everyone thinks, oh, Main Yankee's really safe. Well, the fact is, uh, nuclear power is inherently dangerous. It's not safe, it's inherently dangerous. And uh, again, there will always be another nuclear plant meltdown. You just hope it doesn't happen, you know, near you. Um, so, in fact, uh, you know, for example, Fukushima, I mean, you, you really don't want to eat any fish out of the Pacific Ocean for eternity because of Fukushima. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> this, is a one, this is a wonderful information you've shared with us, Bill, that if anything melts down, it impacts all of us eventually. Absolutely. You know, the because of the you know the winds and the and the currents and everything, uh, you know, talk, they talk about background radiation and that and and but background radiation is because of bomb testing and because of four hundred nuclear plants around the world increasing. So background radiation isn't natural background radiation anymore. It hasn't been for, for a long time. You know, another point I want to make sure that, I, that people hear, a lot of what you hear now is in the effort to revive, you know, the, 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 the dying nuclear industry, um, they'll talk about carbon and so forth and say, well, you know, fossil fuels, we need, the industry will put out the fault, falsehood that we need nuclear power to combat Mm -hmm. climate change and so forth and that's that's a big hook that they they're, they're pushing well it's patently false and i'll tell you why nuclear power now is so expensive that the construction costs alone of building a nuclear plant price it far out of the market any other form of power is cheaper than nuclear by a factor of five or ten times at least and that's just and that's just the construction cost that doesn't that's even before you get into the repair, maintenance, waste disposal, all those uncontrollable costs, just the construction costs make it more the most expensive form of power. So if you're trying to displace fossil fuels, a dollar spent on any other form of power generation will displace far more fossil fuel than nuclear. So it's a, you know, there's don't, don't uh, I, 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 you know, I hope no one gets fooled by this argument that we need more nuclear plants because of climate change. It's it's an absolute falsehood. Um, I, I remember when the, the first effort came to close Maine Yankee and the, you know, the uh, effort by the company of, on television and everything, how you're electric rates were going to go sky high and all these jobs would be lost. And in fact, the electric rates didn't go up. You know, I'm sure jobs were lost, but in fact, well, uh, the, pan the plan, you know, it's, it's like so many other things, you know, the people who were, were the employees who were higher up, none of them were Mainers as a starter. You know? <laughs> Is, so, and they found other jobs, but I, I think it'd be a good example for other states if people, you know, want to get talked into ha uh, the electric rates to, in Maine, that it never happened. I mean, they poured more money into the advertising. Absolutely. You know, um, out in California, yeah, like 30 years ago, 
there was a study done uh, and they called it the green book or the greenie and they did an analysis you know, i think they were looking at shutting down the san onofre plant also called songs so you know like singing a song songs and a bunch of the they, they, uh, had an algorithm and they plugged in all kinds of information uh, and they showed that there's actually more jobs without the nuclear plant there's more jobs in insulation and you can put put carpenters to work and so forth if you're ret retrofitting buildings with uh, alternative energy and more insulation and so forth and they had this book because there was a, an effort to build 10 new nuclear plants out in California. And they, you know, there were some, uh, a lot of like MIT type graduate students out there and they, they put together this uh, algorithm program and plugging in all kinds of information about the cost of insulation and conferences and this and that. And they've showed that it would actually be cheaper uh, to just take the money and help and give it to people to insulate their homes and put in more efficient uh, wiring and so forth. It would actually be cheaper than building 10 new nuclear plants. And, and they would have, you know, the same or more savings or uh, in money and, and, avail and therefore availability of electricity. And they had this book and they took it to all the PC meetings and it took them five or 10 years of just going to the meetings and they would present the book and make, make their pitch. And, you know, the answer would always be, well, thank you for your views. Thank you for your views. Uh, and um, finally, uh, finally they accepted it and they realized, you know, they, but they, they were just, the, you know, the industry and, the, and their, the folks that they put in those positions of like uh, utility public utility commission, uh, they just they just refused to listen. And after five or ten years, they finally did. And it is it's, it's, it's yes, there are certain jobs. I mean, if you're and in fact, you know, a lot of workers at Maine Yankee and other nuclear plants they call them sponges because they you know they soak up radiation. They're exposed to radiation on a daily basis. And if it gets a little high, uh, you know, because they're tested daily, uh, if they get too much radiation, they make them go home for a three months, six months, a year, or whatever. So, um, you know, it's it's not a good it's not a good way to make a living. It does pay well, but you know, there's a price you pay, and there's a lot of uh, you know, a lot of cancers and so forth that came out of Maine Yankee. The Uncensored Guide to Maine, and in the book, they have the whole, they have a big section about Maine Yankee. And I think that we could perhaps see if we could, maybe we could talk to him about getting some more information. I'd like to say thank you. And again, I, I apologize in, uh, for my late start, and I really appreciate your patience in, 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 in helping me get on. No worries, um, and, and we really and, appreciate it, even with a family emergency, that you were able to spend time with us. Well, thank you, and you know, if anyone wants to have a question for me, want, I, I'd just like to, I'll give up my email out. It's abbreviation for Captain, C-A-P-T, Linnell, my last name, L-I-N-E-L-L, -L, yahoo.com, and I'd be happy to, to uh, answer further questions.